Hey y'all, Scott here. Here's how to support the show. Uh, Patreon.com slash Scott Horton Show if you want to donate per interview. Um, and also scotthorton.org slash donate. Uh, anyone who donates $20 gets a copy of the audiobook of Fool's Errand. Anyone who donates $50, that'll get you a signed copy of the paperback in the mail there. And anyone who donates $100 gets either a QR code commodity disc or... Or a lifetime subscription, now only for $100, not two, a lifetime subscription to Listen and Think audiobooks, uh, libertarian audiobooks, listenandthink.com there. So check out all that stuff. And of course, we take all your different digital currencies, especially Zencash and all the different kinds of Bitcoins and whatevers uh, are all there at scotthorton.org slash donate and um, uh, get the book Fool's Errand. Uh, and give it a good review on Amazon if you read it and you liked it, and review the show on uh, you know iTunes and Stitcher and that kind of thing if you want. All right, thanks. Sorry, I'm late. <gasps> I had to stop by the Wax Museum again and give the finger to FDR. We know Al Qaeda. Zawahiri is supporting the opposition in Syria. Are we supporting Al Qaeda in Syria? Well, it's a proud day for America. And by God, we've kicked Vietnam Syndrome once and for all. Thank you very, very much. I say it, I say it again. You've been had. You've been took. You've been hoodwinked. These witnesses are trying to simply deny things that just about everybody else accepts as fact. He came, he saw, he died. But we ain't killing their army, but we killing them. We be on CNN like, say our name, Ben, say it, say it three times. The meeting of the largest armies in the history of the world. Then there's going to be an invasion. All right, you guys, uh, introducing Brett Wilkins. He's editor at large for U.S. News at Digital Journal. And uh, he's written for Common Dreams, Counterpunch, and Daily Coast. And we've been publishing some of his stuff lately at antiwar.com. Uh, one here is the dark side of Israeli independence. And to understand Iran, try history, not hysteria. And since I just finished talking about the uh, foundation of Israel one moment ago with Sheldon Richmond, we'll get to that second. We're going to still talk about that. But I really like this Iran piece, and uh, so that's why I ran it. Uh, welcome to the show, Brett. How are you doing? Thank you. Good morning. Doing uh, great. Yeah, yeah. Very happy to have you on the show here. And so, you know... I like this anecdote, so I'm going to start with it. I one time was getting my air conditioner in my truck repaired by a guy, and he was saying to me, it wasn't even me. It was him saying to me, you know, this whole thing, the only reason Al-Qaeda and them were even attacking us is all because of George Bush Sr. and Bill Clinton picking this fight, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, yeah, right on, you know, that's what I think too, you know, should call off the whole thing. And then he says to me, he says, yeah, but Iran, they just hate us. Man, they hate us. They hate us so much. Hate, 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 hate. And then that was it. That was the end of the thing. And I didn't argue with him about it because, like, what the hell. But he was sure that when it comes to them Shia, man, they got a problem. No point in trying to zoom in and figure out what it really is. And you know what? That's probably because he lived through the hostage crisis and the creation of Nightline, which would have been traumatic for anyone, right? Right. Um, and uh, and the whole reaction and the the uh, disaster in the desert when the rescue mission failed and the horrible embarrassment and and uh, all of that for the Carter administration back then. Uh, a lot of people have a lot of hard feelings, even from way back then. Um, and so, yeah, I like how you argue here. But, yeah, we're over 18. So instead of being emotional, let's just look at some things that happened and maybe figure out if it's important, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, I mean, so, I, when does history begin also, then oh, uh, on America's relationship with Iran, according to you? Yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's ridiculous, this mentality, because I think the Iranian people, I mean, this guy clearly never been to the west side of Los Angeles or anywhere else in the United States where Iranians are living, because, or even to Iran, because they're some of the most pro American people on the face of the planet. I mean, I think Rick Steves, who's by no means any kind of political activist, he's a travel show host, he went to Iran and he was shocked by the treatment that he received there. Strangers were stopping him in the street, giving him flowers, inviting them to their homes. seems that the Iranian people have an ability that many Americans don't, and that's the ability to differentiate between government and the people of a country. 
And it, you know, the Iranians have every reason in the world to hate Americans, but they, they don't. I mean, this is a country that never attacked us. This is a country that hasn't attacked anyone, hasn't initiated a war, of, offensive war since the 1700s. Uh, it's just totally irrational. And if you'll recall, after 9-11, there was even a country song. I forget who did it now, but the lyrics were something like, Iran, Iraq, I don't know the difference. It's all the same to me anyway. Seems that's what you were dealing with with that air conditioning repairman. Yeah. I mean, and that's the whole problem, too, is, you know, a couple of images of a uh, burning American flag and the older, dead, scarier looking Ayatollah who really, you know, you could have made a Halloween mask out of that guy. Right. So the <laughs> fact that he was a former friend of the CIA and everything notwithstanding, we could get into that. But um the, the image is there, and as uh, Adam Johnson has done a great job of showing at FAIR, that just any time Iran is in the news, just always the stock photo is a lady in a veil walking by this one graffiti on this one wall in Tehran that has a skull as the Statue of Liberty. Again, only because of their crazy religion, not because of America ever did anything to them or anything. You know, not that that could possibly symbolize something actually meaningful to them in any way, but just look at these crazy people who say that we're the devil and who dress their women with black hats on. And they, uh, but it's the same picture over and over. In fact, just the other day when the when he when Trump pulled out of the JCPOA, Johnson tweeted out, you know, asterisks as a thousand news editors warm up their picture of the lady walking by the Statue of Liberty skull graffiti thing. And then there was soon enough in the comments under his tweet, everyone was showing, yep, here it is in the New York Times, here it is in US News, here it is at the BBC, here it is all over the place. Just immediately, you can't talk about Iran without showing that same image over and over again. Like, seriously, who's in charge of this thing? I mean, I know there's laziness is in charge, first and foremost, but still, they could be a little creative, you know? It's the same. I think there's a similar uh, mural in Havana they like to show all the time whenever they do a story about Cuba. And it's the same as when they show these military parades of these other so-called aggressive nations that haven't attacked anyone in 50 years. In the meantime, the United States has intervened in how many countries over that period? Uh, it's just standard mm -hmm. procedure when you're trying to demonize and dehumanize an enemy. Prepare the, you know, prepare the field for battle, which we've been doing in Iran since, oh, well, I mean, if you go back to the, the failed rescue attempts, but definitely concertedly since the, since the days of Bush and Cheney, when they actually um, discussed a false flag attack using U.S. Navy SEALs disguised as Iranian patrol boats to attack uh, tankers and American warships. So in order to set the stage to uh, get rid of your enemy, you have to make them into an enemy first. And I, like I said, it's amazing that through it all, the Iranian people remain Staunchly, they love Americans. Well, I mean, they're smart enough to observe that Americans don't know the first thing about it. And so, I mean, especially, I'm kind of grateful for, like, international CNN and whatever, because I think people around the world see that, and they go, oh, this is what they tell Americans to think? Jeez, no well, wonder, I, you know? Yeah, God, they must be terrified. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, now... Um, well, I don't know. Let's go back to the end of World War II, because it's Persia. It's uh, been other empires' sphere of influence, never ours. So then what changed? Uh, so World War II was interesting, because if you go back before World War II, it was the British who were all up in there. They were um, the Anglo-Iranian or Anglo-Persian oil company, which is known better today as BP. Uh, during World War II, you had a transition. I think, I mean, I'm not a historian, but I can't, I can't really recall a time in history where the mantle from one dominant empire to another transferred peacefully, but it happened. And part of the reason why is England was bogged down and defeated, uh, not defeated, but bogged down, and their resources were depleted after the war. The United States moved in and supported the Shah, who I'm sure your listeners are well aware, uh, the right-wing monarchy who, after Mohammed Mossadegh was de um, deposed, Mohammed Mossadegh was the first and only, I believe, democratically elected leader of Iran. He was the, by far the most popular leader in the most popular government Iran knew, but he moved to nationalize some industries. They accused him of being a communist. He wasn't. I mean, the, the Iranian Communist Party was dead set against his rule, but he had to go. And um, President Truman at the time refused, but President Eisenhower, uh, the British, the CIA, uh, which was run by, by one of the Dulles brothers, I believe it was Alan Dulles, and the other brother was a partner at a law firm that represented uh, Anglo- Iranian Petroleum. So 
you know, Mossadegh had to go, and he did go, and he was replaced by, you know, they went from the most popular leader they ever had to a detested monarch, unless you're part of the tiny elite in Iran, who ruled by fear, who ruled by torture. Um, his uh, internal security force, the Savak, was partially founded, I believe, by the CIA. It was definitely trained and funded by the United States, who taught it all kinds of nasty torture techniques. Um, this lasted um, for decades until people had had enough. And in 1978, they rose up. And then everybody's familiar with the events of 1979, the 440 days, four days of hostage crisis. Well, no, I mean, I don't think everybody's familiar with that. I mean, especially, you know, they're, it's the future now, and young people are old enough now to learn this stuff for the first time in a lot of cases here. So, but, and, and one thing, I mean, if, if people know that, you know, the government fell and there was the revolution in 79, I think this is important, and uh, I forget if you uh, mentioned this in your article or not, but the CIA and the State Department advised Jimmy Carter to go ahead and let the Ayatollah come to power. Because the Shah's uh -huh. government was falling apart, and he was sick with cancer anyway, and the whole gig was up. And they said, we know this guy from 53. He helped <laughs> us to overthrow Mossadegh, or, you know, was in on that uh, with them. And they said, I did not know that. Um, oh, that yeah. makes sense. They had Saddam Hussein on the payroll in the 50s, and yeah. they had, uh, well, we can go through a long list of that. Yeah, but, but so what happened was, though, is David Rockefeller convinced Zbigniew Brzezinski to mm. convince Jimmy Carter to let the Shah into the U.S. for mm. cancer treatment. And that was what caused the riots and the mm. seizing of the embassy and the hostages. But that was like three days later. And so we look back at it now as one big thing. When, in fact, the revolution, I mean, I always wondered when I was a kid, I actually saw uh, footage of uh, the Ayatollah getting on the plane in Paris to go fly back to Iran. And I remember, I think, ask my teacher, somebody, whatever the context was, they're like, well, how come, wouldn't the French ask the Americans whether it's okay to put this guy in the plane or not? And of course the answer was, yeah, and the Americans had said, go ahead. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's interesting, I did not know that, and it seems like these kind of situations often repeat themselves. If you'll recall, um, Bahrain, uh, they had a leader who needed some medical care. It was it Yemen, I believe it was Yemen. And even despite the um, Obama's executive order barring human rights violators from entering the United States, what a joke that was, they let him in, and uh, it precipitated all kinds of nastiness over there as well. So no, but I didn't know that about uh, I did not know that uh, the U.S. actually had backed uh, Ayatollah. I mean, we backed Pol Pot at some time. We backed Franco. We backed a lot of nasty people throughout the 20th century, and it doesn't surprise me, actually. Yeah. So... All right, now, um, I think as listeners to this show already know, Bob Perry was the one who found the evidence for this, that Jimmy Carter had given Saddam Hussein the green light to yeah. attack Iran in uh, 1980. And then, of course, as we all know, uh, Ronald Reagan followed up and continued that policy and even sent Donald Rumsfeld over there uh, to negotiate arms sales that eventually included chemical weapons even for use against the Iranians in a horrible war. I mean, people almost, I guess nowadays, maybe forget that there was an eight-year war there, the Iran-Iraq war, in which somewhere between 500,000 and a million people were killed. But anyway, yeah. that's probably, I bet the Iranians and the Iraqis don't remember or care about that. <laughs> you know? I mean, if I could remember it, and I was born in 74, that was one of my earliest memories. There, were, there was, every night on the news, they'd have two little tanks, a little with a little flag, yeah. off against each other. And, uh, yeah, I'm sure they've definitely not forgotten it, if I can remember it. And I was only four years old and not right. even there. So. Yeah, no, I mean, I remember that, too. Um, in fact, you know, the War Nerd, by the way, for people who are interested in this, the War Nerd has uh, a very amoral but very interesting write-up about that war, which he calls just the most exciting war to happen post-World <laughs> War II, as far as that goes. It had air battles, it had sea battles, it had these massive land attacks this and that way and whatever, and it was, for a war nerd, very exciting stuff. Uh, you know, the way it all played out uh, over the course, chemical weapons attacks uh, backed by the American superpower satellite data and whatever. And it's, it's a, it was a big deal in every yeah. way. And, of course, Ronald Reagan also sold missiles to Iran. Yep. Um, you know, less so. He, he supported Saddam more than the Iranians. But anyway, still, yeah. Yeah, we did have that little Oliver North incident. Now, the uh, how ironic is it that the spokesman for good guys with a gun or someone who was convicted for <laughs> trafficking weapons to a, quote, terrorist regime to fund yeah. another terrorist organization? <laughs> and, you know, I saw a thing this morning where 
uh, Debbie Wasserman Schultz, the detestable Democratic congressman, said the NRA are basically close to a terrorist group. And I was like, well, because she's got police power, you know, somewhat. I mean, that really matters for her to talk that way. And I clicked on that. And then it was in response to Oliver North saying the kids from the Parkland attack, as bad as they are in gun control, that they are like terrorists. Yeah. And it's like, dude, I yeah, I don't like Oliver North. What an idiot. You know what I mean? Like, that's exactly how to marginalize law-abiding citizens in the worst way right there. Like, who decided to hire the worst right-winger to be the spokesman for gun owners? Like, you have to be a right-wing nut to own a gun or something. You have to be and a hor- the worst kind. There are good kinds of right-wingers, lots of them, but not that kind. Boy. Yeah. Anyway. I don't know where you stand on the spectrum, but I know your site's uh, libertarian, which I find that... Uh the libertarians and the left have a lot in common. I mean, half the time you all sound genius, and the other time, you, half the time you sound crazy. But no, at that's least you guys. The, but anyway, the most important uh, <laughs> issues facing the world, which are issues of world and peace. I mean, I've I've been reading your site for 10, 12 years now, as I do my own research, and I could have sworn it was a social, like a left wing site. I guess I didn't, you know, I just noticed all the articles were so peace oriented. Yeah, Pat Buchanan writes for us too, because we're, you know, we're a single issue thing. Uh, yeah. War only. And yeah, you know what? It's just like bikers and skaters on the vert ramp. You guys are crazy. No, you guys are crazy. But, you know, we're still friends. Saving the world. That's, yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, now, and, and, and there are, you know, the American Conservative Magazine has got 15 years. They're oh, celebrating beautiful. right now 15 They're years amazing. of being, you know, perfectly anti-war on everything uh, this yeah, entire they, um, time. They had a great so. article on it. I used it every time I get in an immigration debate with my right-wing family. They had a they had a great cover article called Hispanic: The Myth of Immigrant Crime, and it was that's when they caught my attention. I was mm-hmm. like, wow, this is a, a rare publication that doesn't you know going to say something controversial that doesn't fit with the base. But yeah. well, you know, and like, you know, like Daniel Larison, I mean, this is a it's a tangent, but it's an interesting tangent to talk about. Daniel Larison Daily is one of the best American journalists on Yemen, period. I mean, there's only very few who care to talk about it or cover it at all. But he's, you know, writes daily outrages about, you know, the, the war in Yemen. So Daniel Larison. I got it. Yeah, thanks. he's really great there. Anyway, so, uh, yeah, no, I'm, I'm a, as a libertarian and, and especially as an anti-war.com guy, I'm an anti-partisan. I, yeah, I, partisanship is absolutely... I don't even have a side to be on the side of. It's only an issue yeah. thing, you know. Scott, Scott, I went through the 2016 election, and I've been, I covered Donald Trump rallies. I covered Bernie Sanders rallies. I covered Hillary Clinton rallies. And let me tell you, the most rabid reactions that I witnessed during that election, the nastiest things that I witnessed were at Hillary Clinton rallies. When I told them that I can't vote for a candidate who supports war, I can't uh, vote for a candidate who supports child soldiers, as in the Child Soldier Prevention Act waivers, they, the reactions are, I don't know anything about the world, I'm stupid, I'm destroying the country. It was worse than anything I ever saw at any Trump rally, yeah. by far. And I'm, no, I have no love for that guy either. <laughs> yeah, seriously, no. Uh, they say that power corrupts and power makes people stupid, but partisanship has got to be the most mind-deadening phenomenon. It's just yep. sickening, you know, how easy it is to get people to just, uh, you know, I got a fun one. Yeah, the yeah the UN. I don't like the UN because it's not proactive enough on starting this Iraq war. When the entire right wing critique against the UN for generations was that it caused trouble and that it created mandates for America to intervene where it shouldn't be intervening and causing trouble. And then in an instant, yeah, they're in our way when we're trying to start a war. Yeah, yeah. you're so you're so anti world government, dude. Just pushing one out of the way so you can be it instead. I see. Okay. Anyway, let's talk more about picking on Iran. You wrote this great article about it. Um, so you mentioned there uh, what uh, Seymour Hirsch talked about there. It was a proposal. I don't think they really like planned it out or you know had any kind of okay to do it. But right. you know this was credible reporting. And go ahead and elaborate that ag- about that again, would you? Well, because like because it was only. Um you know, something that was discussed in Dick Cheney's office, apparently, that's where it happened. But, um, I, you know, the thing about in our line of work is you can't go too much into things that didn't happen or that you don't know too much about because, so I just knew that it was one of the many false flag, uh, uh, Operation Northwoods comes to mind when they were going to, and some of them are ridiculous, they were going to detonate a nuclear explosion in the atmosphere above Cuba to make Cubans believe that 
the second coming of Christ was nigh because Jesus was mad at Fidel Castro. I mean, these are things you, you know, these are definitely things that were discussed, but more importantly, the things that were done. I mean, supporting the MEK, uh, let me see if I can do this, the Mujahideen al kek <laughs> which is a Baluchi uh, Marxist terrorist group that assassinated six American officials in the 19... 19- 70s and 80s and was exiled in Iraq and was very useful to the United States for sabotage, reconnoiter, reconnaissance, and other um, missions inside Iran. Uh, there's the, the attacks on Iranian nuclear scientists. There's the, the um, sabotage, the Stuxnet attack. Uh, these are all real things that we've done, not to mention it was an accident, but shooting down uh, an, a civilian airliner with uh, 90 passengers on board. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's been plenty of real action against Iran. Actions that, if committed against the United States or Israel, would certainly be considered grave acts of war, punishable by a massive retaliation. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, and, and, and we, we, we accuse Iran of being an aggressor because they support a couple of terrorist groups and, you know, Hezbollah and Hamas. But, I mean, how can you point the finger when, you know, I mean, I believe the United States government is far more of a state sponsor of terror than Iran could ever be. <laughs> well, no question about that. <laughs> I mean, you know, if you're counting. Yeah. Um, you know, another thing here that's really important about the Bush junior years is, you know, in 2007, when they actually just completely forgot to accuse them of having a secret nuclear weapons program for a little while and instead focused on blaming Iran for everything that was wrong in Iraq War II and claiming that every bomb that was ever deployed by a Shiite fighter must have come from Iran and then even therefore must have come from the Iranian government when neither was true. And it was proven a thousand times over those bombs were being made by Iraqis in Iraq uh, by the Shiite side. Um uh, but anyway, and that was, you know, almost a pretext for strikes against not nuclear targets, but against Quds Force targets, Revolutionary Guard targets inside Iran, which they would have, you know, hoped to use to escalate then into a full scale war. And it was the Admiral, who was the commander of Central Command, who is basically insubordinate, Admiral Fallon, who publicly said over my dead body, we are not doing this. And that was it. <laughs> he forced the president and the vice president to just forget about it. And then later, you know, a few months later, and they had delayed it, but the National Intelligence Council, all the American intelligence agencies, put together the NIE that said that, no, they don't have a nuclear yeah. weapons program and they haven't yeah. even been researching it since 2003. And that was basically, you know, the deep state telling the civilians, screw you, we're yeah. not doing another one. <laughs> so... Sometimes it's good we have this standing army. Sometimes it's bad, you know, in terms of uh, checking the ambitions of those with the political power back in D.C. Things could have gotten a lot worse then. Yeah, and then sometimes it's good when all 16 intelligence agencies agree on something, and sometimes it's not. Yeah, exactly. So I'm not sure. You know, that's the one thing I, I always use. I was tending, you know, I, I mean, I think it's, it's ironic that all, through all these decades, you know, the, the conservatives always pointing the finger at Russia, and now Russia could do no wrong. I do believe they've did what every other country of that stature would do. But it's so interesting to see that, um, you know, they say this consensus of the intelligence agencies. Well, the last, the only other time I ever heard consensus from U.S. intelligence agencies was when they all agreed that Iran did not have, nor was trying to develop a nuclear weapon. And additionally, um, Benny, Denny Gantz, the retiring uh, IDF, Israeli Defense Force Intelligence Chief, said the same thing, as did, I believe it was Omer, And so this whole notion that Iran is trying to develop nuclear weapons is just another thing that we went back to earlier, showing that that Statue of Liberty skull mural. It's just something else to keep us on that footing. So, you know, have a veneer of of legitimacy when when the time for attack comes. Hey, let me tell you about the sponsors of this show. First of all, Mike Swanson. He is the author of the great book, The War State about the permanence of America's World War II military empire uh, through the Truman, Eisenhower, and Kennedy administrations, the rise of the new right military-industrial complex uh, after World War II, The War State by Mike Swanson, and also get his great investment advice to protect your financial future there at wallstreetwindow.com. He has a great understanding of what the hell is going on in these financial markets. wallstreetwindow.com. Unless I know he'll tell you, you got to have at least some of your savings. You must know. Uh, some of your savings, however much it is, got to have metals. 
And so what you do is you go to Roberts and Roberts Brokerage Inc. Uh, gold, silver, platinum, palladium. Uh, they have a very small uh, brokerage fee in order to process for you and and get you the very best deal. And if you buy with Bitcoin, there's no premium at all. Uh, for your purchases of gold, silver, platinum, palladium. So check those guys out. Roberts and Roberts Brokerage Inc. at rrbi.co. You ever play baseball? rrbi.co. And uh, as I mentioned, Zen Cash is uh, a great new digital currency. It's also an encrypted method of um, uh, internet messaging and document transfer and all kinds of things uh, for your business, uh, for your secret conspiracies. Uh, Zencash.com. Check that out at zensystem.io. You can read all about how it works, uh, every last detail, of course, at zensystem.io. And then there's this book about how to run your technology business like a libertarian. It's called No Dev, No Ops, No IT. And each of those is one word, three words, you know, get it? Yeah. No Dev, No Ops, No IT. It's by Hussein Badakhchani, and it's about how to run your business right in a libertarian way. LibertyStickers.com um, and Tom Woods Liberty Classroom. If uh, you like learning things, I'll get a commission if you sign up uh, by way of the link on my website. And listen, if you want a new, and the reason my website is down is my own broken servers, uh, but if you want a new good-looking website like the one I do have when it's up and running at scotthorton.org, uh, then check out expanddesigns.com slash scott, expanddesigns.com slash scott, and you will save 500 bucks on your new website. Well, and then you have, you know, there's always been, you know, whatever kinds of hacking and this and that, but at least they say, don't they, that the Obama Stuxnet attack against Iran was, you know, the first real state cyber attack and set a whole new standard, you know, kind of like the use of nukes or the use of drones, bringing a brand new weapon really into play. And, and yep. of course, it got loose, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> yes, it did. And is it determined for sure that that's 100 percent? Was it was it Israel Israel involved in that somehow as well? Well, yeah. Now I'm trying to remember who did the documentary about it. Was it Frontline that did the? Do or, I'm sorry, I don't remember who did the documentary about it. Where they? Oh, maybe it was Alex Gibney or one mm -hmm. of those guys. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sorry, I'm completely blanking on the footnote here. But there's a documentary about this where mm -hmm. th what they say happened was, or maybe this was even. David Sanger in the New York Times? No, I think it was a documentary. Anyway, uh, yeah, it was some kind of documentary. And they say it was the Israelis were like invited in on the program and they tampered with it. And that resulted in it being, a, you know, basically adulterated and ruined it and got them caught. Mm. You know, caused the problems. And before that, it was working kind of thing. Mm. And that was what caused it to get out of control. Uh, yeah, it's all fun and games to get caught. <laughs> Sorry, I should. Uh, can't believe I can't remember what what. Uh, you know what? In the show notes, the great uh, editor Damon will have found the link mm. <laughs> and the, and the documentary I'm talking about. I bet. All right. So um, now Obama was Obama the Great for one day, though, when he passed this nuclear <laughs> deal. But now it's over already. Or uh. American participation in it is. So what do you think that's going to mean? Uh, you know, I think the more important thing is John Bolton is now, uh, you know, in the top national security position in the United States. So that combined mm -hmm. with the abrogation, the unilateral abrogation of the deal, it does not bode well. Um, however, I, I'm not so sure. I mean, the, the, the rest of the world is not on board once again. The rest of the world is not on board. I don't know how much appetite or ability they have right now with all that's going on to deal with this, but... I mean, it's definitely not. It, de it definitely seems we're heading down a dangerous road again, once again, which is back to the norm. Not the, you know, like you said, Obama was Obama the Great for a day, but you know, he was uh, menacing, constantly menacing, threatening to attack Iran. Um, Hillary Clinton threatened to. She said we could. Um, the word she used was obliterate or annihilate one of those um, Iran, and uh, actually sending covert operations and uh, supporting the MEK and the Stuxnet and the um, the assassination of the scientists. So. It, we, we, we still have a way to go before we even get back to that level of, of hostility, but we're on the road toward it again, it would seem. Yeah. 
Boy, yeah, you could see Bolton as the exact opposite of foul and peace, a final status negotiation, an agreement, uh, uh, any kind of uh, pretension of treating these other states like they're human beings equal with us over my dead body. Yeah, maybe know? I could respect that a little more, maybe, you know, instead of playing the game where we're the number one supporter, champion of freedom of democracy around the world, but have supported literally every single right-wing dictatorship since the end of World War II. You know, I always thought I'd have more respect if they just came out and said what they're going to do. Yeah, well, like you said, I think, and look, I'm not sure if you saw the news this morning, but the North Koreans, and, you know, I, I'm with Tim Shorrock. I'm trying to stay optimistic about this, and I think maybe the South Koreans will be able to patch up the difference here and try in the upcoming summit. But the North Koreans are threatening to cancel the summit because of what John Bolton said on the Sunday morning news shows about how, yeah, they're going to have to capitulate entirely or else and blah, blah, blah. And they said, oh, yeah, well, maybe we just won't even meet at all. And of course, then all the liberals are going, and I mean, you know, the Democrat partisans are yeah. in, in media kooks are saying, oh, ha ha, see how incompetent Trump is, blah, blah, blah. That's all they can think of to say is that, you know, his thing isn't working out the way he had said. You know what? I can't stand the guy, but I will tell you this. He had managed to do something that no American president since 1953 has been able to do cut through the BS and get to get down to business. And anytime you're talking, it's preferable to fighting, is it not? And so, I mean, look, I, I understand, you know, that the, what Fox News calls the, the destroyed Trump media. I, I understand, but you got to give credit where credit is due. Nobody's been able to, I'm not saying he's going to deserve the Nobel Peace Prize or anything, because uh, you've probably been paying attention to the dramatic surge in civilian casualties in places like Syria and Iraq and even uh, Yemen, Somalia, and Afghanistan yeah. due to his loosening of rules of engagement and the shift by Mattis from a policy of uh, attrition to one of annihilation. You'll recall Trump on the campaign uh, trail said that he would bomb the blank out of ISIS and take out their families, you know, just straight up announcing he's going to commit war crimes. So I'm not saying he deserves the Nobel Prize or anything, but, you know, he, like you said, the South Koreans are key in this. And if you'll notice that since Trump's been president, a lot of countries that you think might have re reacted in a certain way have actually exercised a lot of restraint in, in the face of the blustery rhetoric coming out of, out of this administration. It's almost like they're sitting back and shaking their heads and playing a long game. China comes to mind. They said a lot of terrible things about China. And, you know, it's fairly, working out fairly well with China right now and to the point where Trump is intervening to save a ch Chinese job. <laughs> so I, this thing with Korea is, I am, I mean, I'm not, I, I see how the world works. I'm not terribly optimistic either, but we've come closer than we ever have. And I would, I would directly attribute that to Trump's willingness to uh, forego the formalities. And, uh, you know, some of these are just ego based. It seems to me to sit down and talk, you know, it's better than fighting. <laughs> You know, I wonder, when uh, Norman Podhoretz attacked Ronald Reagan for negotiating with Mikhail Gorbachev, did the liberals take Norman Podhoretz's side just to spite Reagan? Or did yeah, they say, shut up, Podhoretz, negotiating with Gorbachev is a smart thing to do because he's a commie and they like commies? Or what is the deal? Did they, did they care? They must have taken a side. I bet they were bad on it. I mean, you got to remember that this is a country that's been either at war, occupation, invasion, some kind of military action for uh, 237 of its 241, I believe, 242 years. Now, the only years that we didn't have any of that action was the three, uh, all the years of the Carter administration and the last year of the Ford administration. So this country is on a permanent, the default setting is, is war. And so a lot of times when we try to move away from that, and now, there's a lot of people, and they're not just the, 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 the people in the military or the hard right people that you would suspect. Have you ever watched MSNBC's coverage when there is when, – have you ever watched Rachel Maddow ride into war? I watch her every night because just like I watch Sean Hannity every night, I need to – you know, i got to keep up. No, but I don't I've have the stomach seen... for it, man. I can't. <laughs> so the war – I mean, the, 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 just rhapsodizing. When, when we launched those, that useless cruise missile attack against those bases in Syria last year – or maybe it was earlier, as, as last year, uh, they, they, I believe Leonard Cohen, uh, Brian Williams, Brian Williams on, on, on MSNBC was quoting Leonard Cohen, who would surely turn over in his grave if he heard that his, his, his lyrics are being used to um, glorify war. So 
so a lot of uh, New York Times, you're you know you know you remember 2003. You know what was they, especially funny about that is all he was really saying was like neat fire is shooting out of the back of that rocket at nighttime and it's kind of bright yeah. looking. <laughs> yeah, that's all he was really saying. Like a <laughs> seven year old. Wow, neat. Cruise yeah, missiles that's, are that's cool. Right there. I mean, we all played as boys. We all played war, and we all, you know, it, it, it's until you realize what that really, you know, means when you grow up that, you know, some people just never get over that, I guess. And there's a lot of money to be made as well. There's a lot of money to be made and in, um, in hostilities. So, I mean, I, I don't know yeah. what our budget for quote-unquote defense Oh, yeah. Is. No, I didn't mean MSNBC. Just Brian Williams oh, in that oh, example, Brian. right? He's just mesmerized yeah, yeah, no. by a flame, oh. you know, like a dumb animal. Yeah, I mean, yeah, and they always go to the graphics, and they always go to these, like, awesome, shock and awe graphics showing how awesome our newest weaponry is. And, yeah, it's just, uh, there's, it's, you got to remember that they're, they're, all, they're all not you, and that's why I write for places like this, but they're all, you know, they're all the um, gatekeep, gatekeepers and mouthpieces of the, of the ruling elite of the establishment. Yeah. Now, listen, I mean, I got to accuse Iran of taking full advantage of America's blunders in Iraq and maybe oh, yeah. even, you know, helping to induce Chalabi and, you know, help Chalabi along in, in fooling the American fools into uh, believing this would benefit Israel when really it was going to benefit Iran above all and, and Al Qaeda, too. Um, and they're, they're enemies there. And, you know, in that war... They had full support. They put their full support behind the Bada Brigade and the Supreme Islamic Council and the Dawa Party, just as George W. Bush did. And they were the bad actors. They were the worst forces, aside from Al-Qaeda, which even Al-Qaeda in Iraq was really a reaction to mm-hmm. Iran. Mm-hmm. Iran-backed militias, quote-unquote, in the hands of the Americans, but really maybe the Americans in their hands. Uh, waging this sectarian war against the Sunnis and stealing all of Baghdad. And I'm not saying it was right that the Sunni minority lorded it over the Shiite majority for generations and, right. you know, going back or whatever. But, you know, for the way America and Iran work together in spite of each other, I guess, to fight that war, I mean, that is absolutely brutal. A million people killed. Sunnis stacked like cordwood in the morning with power drill holes in their head. And, you know, Amiri, the head of the Bada Brigade, uh, Mr. Power Drill, just came in. His party came in second place in the elections after Sadr and then um, the Dawa guys after that. So, anyways... Um, you know, I don't want to sound like, oh, yeah, no, I'm pro Ayatollah because they're horrible bastards. And, and if you put Donald Rumsfeld at their service, boy, will they exploit it. Mm-hmm. You know? <laughs> yeah, I mean, Iran's been the big winner through the whole thing. But what you were just speaking to goes back to the wages of intervention. It's the, I mean, you would think we would have also learned this lesson from having supported the Mujahideen in, Iraq, in, in uh, Afghanistan and seeing how they made their way to the battlefields of uh, the Balkans. And then, of course... <laughs> You know, events that we're all familiar with on September 11th. Um, this is this is what happened in Libya. Same thing. This is what happens when you when you get when you stick your nose in where you don't belong, especially when you don't understand all the different parties at play, and when you don't understand or don't care to think too far ahead to what the repercussions of your actions are going to be. There was absolutely no plan for uh, in 2003. Um, I really don't see much of a plan now. What's going on with some of our policies uh, against ISIS and whatnot? Um, but again, I mean, how, uh, if you don't start, I can't say that on the air. <laughs> if you don't start any trouble, there won't be any trouble. So we just need to learn that lesson. Stop intervening everywhere. I mean, how, how many countries now are we intervening in? Yeah. And you know what? If you just put aside all the hype and slogans about world leadership and all this stuff for just a minute and just ask, just put yourself in the other position, either if you were in Iran all this time as America's foreign policies were this, that and the other thing concerning your country and uh, or if it was the Iranians doing it to us here in America because they had all the power and we were the, you know, third world state or second world or whatever type state there. Um you know, you just see the the horror of the whole thing all along, right? If the Ayatollah overthrew our president and installed their dictatorship in our country, oh, could you different. think of anything that- worse than that? But we write that off. Americans write that off like, yeah, you know, that was a thing that happened. But, you know, so. It's different. We're exceptional, don't you know? Yeah. I mean, the, the concept of universality is completely lacking here. It's like, yeah. 
you know, I even I even got in an argument with someone the other day who claimed that, you know, I was trying to say how we did not necessarily need to drop two nuclear bombs on Japan, that Japan was close to, you know, they were broke and broken and ready to surrender. Um, and and this, this younger person I was arguing with said that, oh, we didn't drop nuclear bombs on them, we dropped atomic bombs on them. <laughs> it's just like, no matter what America does, it's the same in Israel. Uh, that eight-month eight month old baby girl who reportedly died of um, tear gas inhalation in Gaza, the, uh, deny. Israel is denying that. And it's the same thing the United States has been doing since day one. It's a settler colonial thing, actually, actually because, I mean, every settler colonial foundation myth, you know, has to ignore the presence of the people that they're, you know, getting rid of to make their new land. So it's, yeah, we don't get the concept of universality. So if that, you know, it's just, that's what I always tried to say all these years. Imagine if someone was doing this to us, how would you feel? It blank stares every time. Yeah. Yeah, I think that was one of the things that Ron Paul really got a lot of uh, headway. He he gave this great speech, but people kind of uh, remixed it and put music behind it and put it on YouTube and this kind of thing. And it's yeah. simply just, what if the Chinese invaded and occupied Texas? And then, in fact, I think one of the YouTubes was some other guy very dramatically reading the speech. Mm. Um, but uh, And then he just basically describes Iraq War II. Only with the Americans as the Iraqis and the Chinese as the occupation troops. And somewhere in there is like, and meanwhile, the whole time they say, no, don't worry. We're only here doing this because we love you so much and we're taking good care of you and rebuilding your society the way it should be. And 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 how how impressed we would not be by that. You know, I mean, come on. It's, you think about that for a minute. It's actually shocking, right? Like if you have an imagination good enough to really think about what that would be like. Boy, and I'm from Texas. I'll tell you what, it'd be a total war is what it would be like. And we all saw Red Dawn growing up, right? Yeah, <laughs> They're course. not terrorists. They're freedom fighters and the Wolverines, right? But, I mean, if we lived in a truly democratic society with full access to information, Ron Paul would have at least been by now multiple times the Republican nominee for president, if not president, or in a really democratic society, he wouldn't even have had to run as a Republican. Yeah. And I, I have great confidence, like Bernie Sanders, that you know, he would have, he, he, he would have been president by now. <laughs> But the same forces that stacked up against candidates on the left are the same forces, and the you know that do the same thing. The, the real alternatives that we were offered, like Ron Paul, mm-hmm. that's a shame. It's a shame that he he's going to go to the grave, never having risen to the level that he should have. Because right. and it, it seems it, like it's ironic, but it's actually not ironic. It's perfectly straightforward that even if it was just up to the enlisted men, judging by their donations, he would mm-hmm. be the president. You know, if yeah, we because, were... I mean, absolutely. I mean, you want to protect, protect uh, you know, put a bumper sticker or a ribbon on your car uh, with support our troops. Yeah, the best way to support our troops is by not sending them to kill and die in, in wars of imperial aggression in the first place. And he got that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, one of the few uh, Republican congressmen to vote against Iraq War II. I think uh, Duncan from Arizona is the last one left there. Mm. And he's well, done. This is his last term. Congress that voted against the war in Afghanistan, Barbara Lee. Yeah. Across the bridge in Oakland. <laughs> right. Yeah, Ron even voted for that one. Yeah. I think against his better judgment, too. But yeah, All right, listen, great interview. Really appreciate it. Uh, keep you, writing and sending me articles. I'll run them. Awesome. Thank you so much, Scott. <laughs> All nice right, thank you, man. Nice appreciate you. it. Later. All right, you guys, that's Brett Wilkins. And uh, he's been writing for uh, Digital Journal, Common Dreams, Counterpunch, and even Daily Coast. Wow, imagine them publishing stuff like this. I wonder, huh? Um, this one is called To Understand Iran, Try History, Not Hysteria. And you know what? We went on about a lot of things, but we forgot to talk about this article. Maybe another time. But it was a good one. And it's in the right margin there. You'll find it. The Dark Side of Israeli Independence. Uh, all about the Nakba there on this Nakba day. I guess it's yesterday, today. All right. Anyway, uh, thanks, you guys. Brett Wilkins. uh, Check him out on antiwar.com. All right. You guys know the deal. Uh, Foolsaron.us for the book, scotthorton.org, and youtube.com slash scotthortonshow for all the interviews. 4,500 of them now going back to 2003 for you there. Read what I want you to read at antiwar.com and at libertarianinstitute.org. And follow me on Twitter at scotthortonshow. Thanks.